Uh, I want to invite you to take your Bible tonight. Turn to the book of Acts, if you will. Acts chapter number 20 and verse 18. And we're going to read all the way down to uh, verse number 38. Acts 20, verse number 18. This, of course, is uh, uh, the Apostle Paul. And um, as we read this, you'll get a little better insight as to uh, where we're going with our message this evening. I'll have you stand as we read uh, this evening. Acts chapter number 20 and verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit into Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after many departings shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance amongst all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them who are with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all, and they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you this evening for your word once again. We are grateful as we uh, consider uh, the courage that the Apostle Paul would show forth for us as an example, as a, uh, a pattern for us to follow in serving you, setting all things that would perhaps distract aside and keep our attention focused entirely upon you. I ask that this evening that you would just anoint me afresh with the power of the Holy Spirit of God and that we would have spirit-filled listening. So thankful for your word tonight how it can uh, influence our thoughts, our thinking, our direction, and keep us going in the direction you'd have us to be. Now I pray that, Heavenly Father, you'd take uh, control of this service, that the Holy Spirit would have free course here tonight, that when we leave this place we can go out through those doors towards our cars this evening, we'll know that we've met with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May be seated. Here we see uh, Paul, we, we know Paul is a man of faithfulness, we know he's a man of humility and compassion, but we, he is also a man of great courage. As we consider the Apostle Paul, you know, a lot of us uh, have uh, several hats we wear. You know, you have hobbies and special interests, you know, you have your career, your job, and caring for your, uh, your families. Um, Paul is uh, uh, what we would term a tent maker. And that word tent maker is um, what we would use to correlate or to explain someone like myself or Pastor Gibbons. We're tent makers. That means uh, we don't make tents, but that's the title that we would use. Um, Paul was a literal tent maker. And he looked after his needs. He would make tents and he would sell them. 
And I think they probably would have been collector's items. I don't know. In fact, I, if you ever go to Bass Pro and you go into the tent section, you might find one of his. I don't know. If you do, it'll be a collector's item. I promise. You want to hang on to it. Yeah, but, but I'm sure the, the Apostle Paul made the best tents. Why do I think that? Well, I've been in construction most of my life. And I have uh, been able to evaluate people by... Uh, what their vehicle looks like and how they promote themselves, how they, how they work and their, how their speech and, and how their actions are and their attitudes and so forth. And your best quality workers, your best quality tradesmen, you know, uh, are easy to point out. And we see all those attributes in the Apostle Paul. Uh, he was probably one of the greatest and a wonderful tent maker. Um, but most importantly, he was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, uh, he had the skills and knowledge um, to be a maker of tents, but he had other interests as well. And those other interests really come out here in, you know, ch chapter 20, verses 18 through 38, what those interests might be. So I want us to consider that in light of the fact that Paul is a man of great courage. Notice what it says in verse 18 again. And when, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you all you to at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. Um, Paul is a man of what we would say uh, courage because of these temptations which can be interpreted persecutions that he is going through. He was constantly persecuted by the Jews. He was, they were always laying traps for him. They were always trying to trick him. But he never backed up or backed down. Whenever he got into trouble, he stood firm on what he believed. I believe we need more people like that in 2023. They're willing to take a stand for what we believe in the word of God. It's sad when Christians are embarrassed, shy, nervous about proclaiming the fact that they're saved. Uh, you know, uh, we ought to be bold about our, our relationship with Jesus Christ so that we can influence others. Now, I don't mean being brash. I don't mean that at all, but there's a difference between brash and bold. Now, Paul wanted to do God's will, no matter what it meant. He set his own needs and his own desires aside in order to accomplish those things, and he did that right there uh, in Rome and in other parts and regions uh, that went beyond. He also knew God wanted him to go to Jerusalem. Now, going to Jerusalem, and I've been to Jerusalem, uh, would have been a lot different for Paul. I know uh, Brother Gibbish has been there as well. But when Paul is going to go there, um, he knows already in advance what to expect. He knew that he would be in danger the moment he goes into Jerusalem. Why? Well, the Jews wanted to kill him. <laughs> they had no desire for him. They didn't like him for what he was preaching well, quite frankly, they were losing membership in the Sanhedrin, and they were losing membership on you know, uh, those that were following him. And, and those people were turning to Christ. They, and they're turning their hearts to the Lord. So when that happens, it began to affect their pocketbook. Because no longer were these people giving into the coffers of the Jewish uh, realm there in Jerusalem. And so, of course, they're angry. Um, so he's going to be in danger as soon as he goes there. Notice what it says in verse 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit into Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me, save the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Paul has an idea that this is not going to be a warm fuzzy. They're not going to have a parade for him. I remember when we were riding uh, from Alaska down into Mexico, and uh, when I got to Tizapan, just outside the orphanage in uh, um, uh, Lake Chapala, uh, the mayor came out, and we had a, uh, they had a big celebration and, and, and speeches and so on. Uh, Paul can't expect that when he comes into Jerusalem. In fact, he's going to have the very opposite to expect. Now, just for a moment, imagine I asked you to come with me on a, maybe a trip. Uh, maybe uh, we're going to go visit somewhere. And, and, and when we start, you know, making preparations, uh, maybe I suggest to you a couple things that, well, you might want to prepare for. Maybe I would say something to you like, uh, well, there's a couple things you need to be aware of. When we, you know, drive into the driveway there, they're probably going to be throwing rocks at your car. Um, and so if you, as, you know, get out real quickly, so they'll stop throwing rocks at your car, but 
then they'll probably be throwing them at you. And, and then uh, once, uh, you know, if you approach them, they'll stop throwing rocks at you, but they'll start beating you with their fists and maybe other objects that they've got there, and they, they will beat you until you fall on the ground, and then they'll start kicking you, and then they'll probably tie you up, and most likely you're going to be handcuffed. You might stop to think, maybe we should go somewhere else. You ever been to Philadelphia? <laughs> uh, but, but, or, or uh, no, Pastor Gibbish and Willie, I'm not talking about Cambodia. Okay, we're going there in three weeks, right? But that's not what's going to happen. But supposing that was someplace that we did go, uh, you would probably have second thoughts about whether you'd ever want to go back or whether you would want to go there at all. But not the Apostle Paul. He's willing to go knowing full well that there is going to be danger there for him. Um, was he afraid? Well, I think he would be afraid just as anybody would be of pain and, and knowing that, that, that something bad is going to happen, you know, um, it's kind of like uh, John Wayne made a quote uh, a number of years ago. Um, he was still alive then. Um, and uh, he made the quote, uh, Courage is being scared to death, but saddling my horse anyways and still going. And that's what the Apostle Paul was like. Regardless of what was going to take place, which already been prophesied, he knows it's going to happen, he goes anyways. You know, uh, here's part of God's warning to Paul about what's ahead for him. Notice what it says in verse uh, 10 and 11 of chapter 21. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet by the name of Abagus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So the prophet Abagus is pointing out as clearly as he can, uh, I'm going to borrow Paul's girdle. And, and, and he goes and he does an illustration with it. And the guy that owns this girdle, this is what's going to happen to him. He said he bound his own hands and feet, and Paul can expect no less. Now, don't misunderstand. Uh, when we're talking about the girdle here, this isn't what you're thinking. Uh, a girdle in Bible days was just a belt. And uh, oftentimes when people were traveling across the desert, if they had to go a long distance or if they're in a hurry, they would take, and they, they wore long flowing robes, they would take that robe, they would pick it up, and they stuff it into their belt, which they called a girdle. And so uh, Abigus simply takes Paul's belt, and he wraps it around his wrist like this, then he wraps it around his feet, and then he says, the one that owns this, this is what they can expect. Uh, they're going to be met with adversity. In fact, they're probably going to be bound. Well, generally when you're bound, there's a purpose for that, and you're probably going to go to jail. Look at verses um, 12 and 14. I'm sorry, in chapter 21, 12 and 14. And when he heard these things, both we and they, that, that place, besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep? And to break mine heart, for I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. Paul is saying, I'm not afraid. Uh, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And, and I'm willing to go beyond what uh, maybe uh, you would do, because God has placed that upon my heart. You know, um, Paul paints for us, I, I think, three pictures um, in chapter 20. He gives us three illustrations we can look to tonight that reveal three of the passions that he had in his own life. And we realize he wasn't just a tent maker. He was, and a good tent maker. Uh, he made a living that way. Uh, he was a wonderful preacher, much of the New Testament of which we have. Paul wrote. Uh, but he had three occupations that he always wanted to do or always was interested in or enjoyed seeing. Um, we could kind of go back to Paul and say, well, what do you want to be when you grow up, Paul? <laughs> I want to be this, this, and this. It's kind of like my wife when she was traveling across North America driving my pickup truck and trailer. You know, uh, she's driving a diesel truck with a 32-foot uh, or a 33-foot horse trailer up and down mountains on icy roads and snow. Uh, and she became so good at it. I remember uh, Richard uh, Howell being with us I uh, said, Mrs. Crow, what do you want to be when you grow up? A truck driver? He said, no, not at all. But Paul has got three things he is interested in. So if we consider verse 24, 
in our text in chapter 20. It says this, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So here is Paul. He knows what he's heading into. And as we look at this terminology that he's using, he says this in verse 24, Neither count I. I, my life, dear unto myself. What Paul is saying is, I'm saved. Jesus bought me with a price. I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die. And I trust him in all things, even with my life. But I count not the value of my life uh, unto myself. But he says, it is what I have given unto God. It is my reasonable sacrifice. Later on, we hear Paul saying, you know, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, he practice what he preached and it's exactly what he's doing so this is uh, this whole terminology in verse 24 is an accounting term uh, it, it, it means to look at well the income and expenses the uh, assets and the liabilities to examine the ledger if you please like a, a, a profit and loss statement and count the cost that's what he's saying here he says I've counted the cost I know what this is, may very well cost me my very life We'll be doing that in a little while. You know, we have our business meeting, and so we'll be counting the cost. We'll be looking at the ledgers and seeing where we're at for uh, 2023. But Paul says, I put my life on one side of the scale, and then uh, on the other side of the scale, I put that which God has uh, for me to do. And he says, when I weigh out that scale uh, on one side or the other, I find that God's work is more important than me than my life, than my desires, than my wants. And I find myself in the red. And Paul says, hey, I, I, I just know that what I'm doing is for God, and I know what I'm doing will have consequences in the future even after I'm gone. And so I'm willing to give of myself and give myself to God. You know, back in the 1950s, you recall there was a, a group of missionaries who was famous. Jim Elliott was one of them, and they went to the Aka Indians um, in, in Ecuador. They were there to try and... Um, uh, convert the Indians, and what they had done, they had a small plane that Jim Elliott was flying, and, he, and they flew over, and they would drop food down, and we actually saw a video, I think four or five years ago here, called The End of the Spear, and it was a story of Jim Elliott's son, who uh, uh, was a little boy, uh, I think he was maybe eight years old at the time, when Jim Elliott went on that uh, infamous or famous flight, and uh, uh, while he was there, he gave his dad a airplane, a little miniature airplane that he and his dad had made together. Put it on the airplane and said, Dad, take this with you. And uh, he took it. They flew over those Indians, and those Indians came out onto the shoreline. And misunderstanding, they had dropped the food down. The Indians came out and took it and, and then went back into the jungle. They decided to land there, and uh, they have footage, and it wasn't too long after they landed that they were attacked by this group of natives, and uh, all five of them were killed. Jim Elliott had made this statement when somebody said, don't you think it's kind of uh, dangerous to go there? Don't you think it might be kind of uh, foolish to go on such an errand when you think, you know, you, might, you could lose your life. Jim Elliott, of course, gave us that very famous line, no man is a fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain which he cannot lose. And the Apostle Paul was the example of that from the very beginning. Uh, the Apostle Paul knew what was going to happen. And he looked at it, he added up the things that could happen and would happen according to the prophet. And he decided, I'd rather die in the will of God than to live outside the will of God. If I live outside of the will of God, then I will have lost all that God has for me for the future and in the accounting of it in heaven. And so Paul looks at this as an accountant and he realizes it pays to serve God. It truly does. Um, have you ever discovered that fact? You know, uh, have you ever uh, put the practice, Luke 6, 38, given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, shall men give unto your bosom? Um, we equate that to money all the time, don't we? Given it shall be given unto you. And that's okay, it can mean that. It can mean finances, but it doesn't say that. It doesn't say give money and it shall, money shall be given unto you. That's not what the verse says. It says give and it shall be given unto you. Uh, and it doesn't matter what it is that you give, God will return it. 
whether it's a smile to somebody and you get a smile back from somebody, whether it's uh, your talents, your abilities, the things that you hold dear. Maybe uh, it sure can be your finances, but it could be so many other things, your time. You give those things to God and God says, I've got a blessing for you and I'll give back to you those things which you have already given, but not just give it back, press down, shaking together and running over. Secondly, we see not just Paul looking at this as an accountant, but he's looking at it as a runner. We find a lot of times he uses illustrations in sports. Um, I'm not talking about sports illustrations. I mean, illustrations in sports as far as Olympics and that kind of thing. And here he's looking at things as a runner. Um, he uses the language uh, of a runner. In verse 24, he says, I finished my course. Um, look at Hebrews 12, 1 for a second. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24, it says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? I mean, they run all out. They give all. If you want to win, you've got to run hard. You can't just kind of lollygag along. Uh, you're not going to win that way. But one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. What is Paul saying? He says, hey, I'm your pattern, and I'm giving all. I'm going to run, but you should too. You should run in the race God's got for you, whatever that might be. And it might not be the same race I run, but it's a race that God has for you. But when you get into the race, run all. Give it all. Give it all that you got. You'll not be disappointed. God will repay you your efforts back many times over. And see, if we're going to live for God, we might as well put our heart into it. We might as well give him all that we've got. Go all the way. I mean, go for the gold. <laughs> By the way, I don't mean that in a monetary aspect. Go for the gold. The golden streets in heaven one day when we are going to be there. Philippians chapter 3, 14 says, I press towards the mark for the pride, for the high calling of Christ Jesus. You know, Paul looks at this and quitting's not an option for him. Um, I don't know about you, but I want to finish well. Whatever I do, I want to finish well. Now, I don't know when that time will be, but uh, God knows whenever that time is, when it comes, I want to finish well. And I know Paul finished well. And I know that that being our pattern or our example, which he got from the Lord Jesus Christ himself to finish well, we ought to decide we're going to finish well. 2 Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought a good fight. Uh, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I wonder if we could say that when it comes time for us to leave this world. And by the way, that might be soon. I mean, it might be tonight. I mean, I mean yeah, it could be the rapture. Or one of us might have a heart attack going home tonight. We don't know. My, my sister-in-law, as I mentioned to you just uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, had, you know, and she's a young, healthy lady, only 58 years old, and, um, you know, she had a stroke. We, we just don't know. Um, and it could happen to any one of us. And I wonder, could we say, I fought a good fight? I finished my course? I have kept the faith. Or would we find ourselves wishing we had done more? wishing that we had been more active, wishing that we had been more uh, fervent in sharing the gospel with those we love and care for. Now, the Christian life is not a sprint. I mean, it might have been when we first got saved. It's not even a 100-yard dash. It's a marathon. It's getting involved and keep going the distance. You know, this is the good news. Um, this is wonderful news. I'm not running against you, and you're not running against me. And none of us are running against the Apostle Paul. We have our own race to run. You know, and, and it has nothing to do with anybody else, what they're doing. Our responsibility is us. And, and we have a pattern to do our best at whatever it is. I mean, I'm glad we're not running our race against Paul. I mean, he, uh, he'll leave us in the dust spiritually, I mean. Um, uh, but we ought to do our level best until we hit the tape, we break through that, we finish our course, we finish the race that God has set before us. So question, are you running? Are you running all? Uh, have you slowed down? in your service to God at all? Uh, you used to be more faithful to church. You used to come all the time. Have you slowed down a little bit? You know, uh, how's your race going? How's the run happening? Do you still tithe like you used to or that kind of fallen by the wayside? Uh, do you, you, are, are you still in the race or, or you kind of slid out of the race? 
you used to pray with your family. Do you still pray with your family? Have you slipped away from doing that? You got busy, occupied, distracted from doing that and doing other things. Uh, uh, somehow, we look at those things and we can get so easily sidelined. Um, you used to be excited about reading the Bible. Are you still excited about reading God's Word? If not, and maybe it hasn't been opened in a long time, you've fallen out of the race. And I encourage you tonight, get back in the race. Start reading God's Word again. Start praying like you used to pray. Start giving like you used to give. <laughs> so, how is it going? Your race. What's the secret to finishing well? Well, um, some of you already are. I say that by saying um, you have been given a goal. You have been given a, uh, a, a job to do. God has given you a ministry, and you have hit it full tilt. And you are at the, the end of that where you will finish well. You've, you've, been, you've invested your life in serving God. Some of you, uh, perhaps, um, that are my age or older will say, wow, I don't know how many more miles the race is going to be, but we don't have any reason to slow down or quit. We need to keep on going. We need to keep going forward. Don't back up. Don't quit. Don't back down, but keep going forward. There's much for us yet to do. Maybe we don't have the energy we used to have. Maybe we don't have the zeal, but it doesn't mean we have to quit. Get back in the saddle and keep on going. So what's the secret? Stay the course. Don't quit. Keep on going. Stay reading the Word of God. Stay praying. Um, look at verse number 2 now in Hebrews uh, chapter 12. Verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down in the right hand of the throne of God. I mean, what better pattern, what better, uh, uh, you know, um, person for us to look to as far as the future in doing what we ought to do is to what Christ himself did and what he gave. He gave all. Um, We've got to keep our eyes on that goal. Any farmer will tell you, you get your eyes off the, uh, the furrow that you're trying to make into your farm, and you start looking side to side, and if you're not using one of these uh, uh, newer tractors that are GPS controlled, you'll find your furrow going all over the place. You've got to keep going straight down the line. It's much the same as when you're driving your car. I mean, if you're driving along and all of a sudden, uh, wow, you see uh, that special store you like to shop at and there's nobody in the parking lot and you're thinking, oh, I'd sure like to go there. And you're driving along and you, you stop looking and, and you see it go behind. You'll find that the wheel starts to turn that direction and you'll get off course. And the runner is the same. A runner is not worth his salt if he starts looking back to see who's close behind him. He'll probably trip and fall, and he'll lose the race. We've got to keep our eyes on the goal. That's what Christ did at the cross. That's what Paul did. He finished well. If you look off to the sidelines of the crowd, you'll trip. You'll fall every time. You'll be distracted. You'll get off course. And perhaps you'll even find yourself disappointed in where you end up. If you're always looking back over your shoulder in your spiritual life, the past sins, perhaps that you got bogged down in your life, or maybe some of the regrets or disappointment that you have had in your life, you'll never go forward. You've got to leave those behind. That's what Paul is saying. Lay aside all those things and keep going. Run the race without those things holding you back, holding you down. If you're constantly comparing yourself with other people, you'll find yourself always at the back of the race. Because you'll start thinking, I just don't measure up. I'm not as good as so-and-so. I'm not as good as so-and-so. Can I just encourage you, so-and-so is not as good as you in a lot of areas. In fact, you ought not to be comparing yourself with so-and-so anyways. You need to compare yourself with Jesus Christ. He's the one that we compare ourselves, and he is our goal. We are to become Christ-like in our life. You will never become Christ-like just at looking at a person. That person will disappoint you. That person will, will disillusion you. Uh, you need to keep your focus on the one that really matters, and that's Christ himself. Thirdly, Paul is a steward. In verse 24 of our text, go back, if you will. Verse 24 says, The ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. Well, God has given to me a ministry, and he's given to you a ministry. Mine may be different than yours, and yours different than mine, but we all have a ministry to do. Some may be in uh, the ministry of the church. Some may be in the ministry of your own family. 
Paul never saw his ministry as just belonging to himself, but he looked at it as God's. And he was God's workman. He was God's uh, uh, you know, ears and eyes and, and hands here that God could use. This place I'm grateful for. And when you, uh, and I'm not talking about you as people. I'm grateful for you. You're my family. I love you. I'm so thankful for you. But when we think of the building, um, some people say, well, that's my church. Or someone will say, that's Lens Crow's church. Or you might say, well, that's his church. Or that's my church. And we have ownership. We, we look at it, that's our place. That's where we belong. Um, but in truth and reality, when I hear somebody say, oh, that's Len Crow's church, I say, oh, wait a minute, no, it's not my church, that's God's church. I just, I just get to go there, praise God for that. And so do you. Well, what a blessing, we get to come here. Why? Because we're all part of the church. Because the church is not the building. This is just a shell. When the rapture comes, this building's not going to heaven. Just you, the people, that's the church. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 19 says, What know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not of your own? Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Where did Paul get his faithfulness? Where did he get that humility and compassion that he had? Where did he get that courage? To go to Jerusalem, knowing that, like as Abigail said, he would have his hands tied, his feet tied. They're probably going to stone him. They're going to beat him. They're going to imprison him. He knows what's coming. He's been through it before. You see, Paul, when he went to different towns, he didn't go to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Internet and find out, okay, where's the best motel in, in, here in uh, Judah? Where's the best hotel I can go to here in Nazareth? He didn't do that. <laughs> He checked out the local jail because that's where he knew he was going to be going. That's where he spent more time. Where did he get all of those things? He viewed himself as an accountant uh, and decided that in the end, it pays to serve God with a whole heart. He was a runner. He said, I'm going to finish my course. And then he submitted himself as a steward that had no rights. No rights to make decisions, no rights to his own life, but submitted his life to God in whatever service God had for him. I wonder in 2023, what have we got left? 11 months, plus or minus a little bit. I wonder if we could just determine, let's finish well. 2023, got 11 months left in it. Not a spot or a wrinkle on the calendar of those months yet in my life or yours. Let's make the best of those 11 months and serve God with a whole heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us, the blessings you give us. We are grateful this evening for the fact that we can be here as a body of believers, as a family. So thankful for the fact, Father, that you have given us this place to meet. And we're thankful even for the country in which we live, where we have the freedom to read from the word of God, to pray, to sing. Um, these things we can do in public. And they might not always be so, but they are today, and we are grateful for that. I pray that you'll help us determine today, not put it off till tomorrow or next week, but tonight we'll determine we're going to do our level best to finish well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.